Welcome to a special episode of the Radio Vagabond. I am so happy to uh, be joined by Marissa. Uh, and you need to help me say your last name. <laughs> Both of us were name helpers. Marissa <laughs> Medin. <laughs> Medin. Medin. Yes. Yeah. Because the reason I'm saying that is just to give you back, because we just did uh, a, an episode over on your podcast, and we'll get back to that, where you were talking to me, and we had a lot of fun with my name, because it's uh, so hard for people to say. So, of course, I can say Medin. <laughs> but where does, it, where does it come from, Marissa? I think it was so... My background, so you wouldn't guess it, is Russian and Polish, like way, way back in the day. And I think it was Medinsky, maybe Russian, that got shortened <laughs> when my family came to America many, many years ago. Yeah. We're the only Medins. Yeah. Well, you don't want to have the ski. I know. We had to be more Americanized to fit in back in the day. So that's where it comes from. But yeah, no one really... Everyone's like, Medin? What, what is this name? Yeah. Well, welcome. If travel is your passion... And you want escapism while still upholding your work and family responsibilities. You can travel vicariously from the comfort of your own home. This is The Radio Vagabond. This is an interview episode of The Radio Vagabond, as always supported by Hotels25.com, the place where you get the best deals on a place to spend the night. Hotels25.com, it's best price guaranteed. Well... About this episode, I know that you guys listening love to travel and hear about adventures in faraway places, but a lot of you are also interested in the nomadic lifestyle. How is it even possible to sit on a beach somewhere in the world with your laptop and do your work? Well, that's a picture often portrayed. In fact, if you Google digital nomads and then go to the image section, <laughs> I think that's the first 20 pictures you'll get. But it's not really the case that we sit on a beach with our laptop and an exotic cocktail within reach. That's not the case. Well, sometimes. In fact, I'm editing this episode at a table in front of a pool in an exotic location somewhere in the world. So sometimes it is the case. And today's guest, Marissa Medin, has a company that helps you become a digital nomad so you can also travel the world. It's called Beach Commute. And you'll get to hear a lot about that. And if you're interested in that, you should listen. And if you also want to hear some great travel stories from Marissa, like the time when she got invited to a wedding in Egypt and said yes to the invitation, you should also keep listening. For me, like, you really have to sit and check. You know, I was 30, 31 at the time, a fe you know, a solo female traveler. And it's really important, like, I have to check in with my gut of, like, Is this a good idea? <laughs> you know? Marissa Medin has been a nomad a little bit longer than me. And in this episode, you can hear how she became nomadic and how she makes it work. We're also going to be talking about community, making friends and romance along the way. She'll share her thoughts about the good and the bad about living this lifestyle. Both are equally. I love to talk about both because it, it's so important. And what it's like being a solo female traveler. All in all, there's so much inspiration, tips and tricks in this episode. You are listening to The Radio Vagabond, your guide to taking that first step towards living a more fulfilling and adventurous life. Right now, Marissa, you're a nomad, but you're you're back home uh, in Atlanta. Yeah. So um, is that a COVID thing that you went back to uh, Atlanta or what's the reason you're back there? Wonderful question. I actually came back for a friend's wedding that's coming up this weekend, one of my best friends from college. So the last two and a half months, I was all over Eastern Europe and Bulgaria, Hungary, uh, Czech Republic, I don't even can't remember, Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, I was all over. So I was kind of go, go, go mode. And now I just came back for this wedding, take a little chill pill for a second before hitting the road again. Who knows where that will be? But yeah, kind of coming, coming and going as a nomad. Is that also a part of getting the hunger back for more adventures? Yeah, well, typically, I feel like I just kind of, usually I know about how much time I have. So it'll whether it's two months, four months, six months, there's usually something that brings me back to Atlanta, to the States, like a family wedding or a good, it's usually a wedding or like the holidays or something like that. So I kind of gauge what I'm doing and how fast and how hard I'm going to travel based on when I know I'm coming home. So I'll maybe stay somewhere for a month or two months and then uh, just do, you know, 
five or six countries quickly if I know I'm coming home and I can take a rest. And so, yeah, I I think of myself as a full-time nomad because I don't always, have, sometimes I'll just stay at my parents' house or I don't have a home when I come back. I have a condo that I rent out. And so, yeah, it's really just kind of, I never know where I'll be or when, but I when I am back in Atlanta or in the States, I feel like it's a much needed rest because I've usually pushed myself really hard right before I've gotten there. Hmm. Well, let's let's hear a little bit of more about how you became a nomad. Where, where, where do you come from work-wise or how did you come up with the idea that you wanted to travel more and uh, how was that possible? Yeah. Take me back uh, to to when that transition happened. I can say it very clearly. So I was a very typical, like, studied business in college, wanted the corporate career. I actually worked at Pepsi for about six years, both in our global headquarters in New York and then in L.A. And I thought this was, like, that's what I thought I wanted in life. And as I felt locked in the cubicle, as many people do, and I didn't, you know, it was hard having a boss and commuting and all of that. Um, I had a boyfriend who um, also worked at Pepsi. I lived with him at the time in New York, and he had a headhunter call and got a job out in L.A. So Pepsi was great. They basically made a job for me out in L.A., but I took two months off in between our lease. I was like, my lease is ending at this date. I'd like to start, you know, two months later in, the, in this new role, if if that's okay. And it was easier than I ever imagined. Basically, you know, it's such a huge company. I just talked to HR. They were like, here's a form, sign this. It was almost as if I was taking like a maternity leave, mm -hmm. but to travel instead of have a baby, which I was like, why isn't everyone doing this? Why didn't I know I could do this? It was kind of ask and it was given. And really, I did this because um, so I'm I'm technically I say technically I'm I'm Jewish I'm not a very religious person but um, <laughs> technically Jewish <laughs> technically I'm like no I am I should say that but yeah by technically I'm, I'm I don't know it's a different story but in the U S or I don't know if it's other countries as well but you can get an basically an all expenses paid flight and trip for ten days in Israel basically they're trying to keep like the Jewish religion going and by like taking you to the homeland so you can only do this they've changed the date since. A little bit older, but at the time you could only do it until you were 26 years old. And all my friends had already, you know, any Jewish friends I had had already done it. Like we were in college and I was busy doing work and other things. And so I took this time. I was like, this is the last time I can do it. Like, I don't know, why not? So I booked a, I, I booked this. Uh, I went to Israel for 10 days and then you can extend it. So I convinced two of my college friends to meet me. Actually, the one who I'm, I'm back for her wedding, she met me in Greece and Turkey. And then my, my boyfriend at the time met me in Brazil for the World Cup, and we went to um, Peru and Costa Rica. We were just I was kind of like all over. And that's when I caught the travel bug. Mm -hmm. So I got back to L.A. where I was supposed to start. This was my first kind of work remote experience. So I was working from home in Los Angeles, and suddenly I was like, whoa, I can do my job not in an office. But I still had to be in the States and still go back for meetings and be in L.A. for meetings and stuff like that. But the partner I was with at a time, we got engaged and he was, um, he grew up in Kenya. So we shared a love of travel. And so we were planning to get married and like quit our jobs, travel for six months. Our, my parents were terrified. Everyone thought we were insane, but like <laughs> that was the goal. I thought that was the only way I could travel for an extended time was to like save up, quit my job and, um, you know, do that and then go back to the quote real world. And we ended up, I, I left that engagement, wonderful person, just not my, not my partner for romance and life. But that really was what sparked just like a whole change in me. I changed everything. I left LA, I quit my job. I went back to Atlanta. I started a business and I had read the four hour work week around this time as oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> as one does. The typical cliche. I'm like such the cliche nomad story. I like broke my first <laughs> one way flight to Bali when I started, you know, all the things, but it really just made me start thinking differently. And so when I quit and started this business, um, everything I did, I always say, start with the end in mind and work your way backwards. And my end in mind was how do I have a job where I can work from a computer anywhere in the world and travel. And so that is, you know, it took me four years, probably from the time I read that book till the time my business was successful enough to go do that. But that was kind of, those were the catalysts that sparked this whole journey for me. Mm. That's a bit to to unpack here. So <laughs> there's a lot. <laughs> that journey you, you took, it was a 
I wouldn't say dipping your toe, but more like dipping your whole foot in, uh, in, yes. the, in the travel pool. Right, uh, right. Because you did go uh, quite a few places. Yeah. And also, I think it's it's interesting. You're from Atlanta and still it wasn't Coca-Cola. It was Pepsi that you worked for. Uh, Even you know this <laughs> from Denmark. Yes. I was there. Uh, I was uh, When I was in Atlanta, I went to the Coca-Cola Museum. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for anyone listening, global like Coca-Cola headquarters are in Atlanta where I grew up. And when I was a kid, if I went to a restaurant, I was like, can I have a Coke? And they're like, is Pepsi okay? I'd be like, absolutely not. Like, I w- would not drink Pepsi. <laughs> like, well, hands down. Like, you are a trader in Atlanta. Like, my friends, anyone from Atlanta does not drink Pepsi. I, I have a, I have a friend who uh, changed airlines because they, they switched from uh, Coca-Cola to Pepsi. And then he said, I cannot fly with them. Wow, that is brand loyal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's such a it's such a real thing. And as a Pepsi employee, you're like not allowed to have any Coke products. But it, it's so far beyond Pepsi and Coke. It's like Gatorade and Tropicana and orange juice and pe- like all the f- mm-hmm. free delay, all the snacks. And it gets to be a lot. But I wanted to I knew I wanted to work in um, like for a big global brand company. And I wanted to live in New York City after college. And uh, Pepsi fit that bill and they recruited from my college. And I remember my interview with them was actually it was kind of a joke. I just interviewed with like you know, all those kind of companies who are coming to campus. And it was at 8 a.m. the morning after my 21st birthday, which in the U.S. is when you're, like, legal, allowed to drink. And so I could barely talk. <laughs> I don't – I still – I'm like, why did you hire hire me? But I really got along with – like, I loved the, the people and my coworkers, and, like, they were my people. So I'm loyal to both, but it was a great experience. <laughs> And then getting back to you, um, you said that you built your business. And what kind of business was that? Yeah. So I'm going to take you through a quick journey of several different businesses I've started to where I am today and feel free to dig further in any of them if you're interested. So the first one that I started was actually an e-commerce dessert business. So growing up, my mom had had brick and mortar dessert only restaurants that she had closed like 20 years before um, I restarted it. And people would like track her down asking her for her desserts because they were so good. And so when I was in this crisis of like I'd left this engagement, I didn't know where I wanted to live or what I wanted to do or, you know, I was just very lost and and healing and and all of that. And someone had tracked my mom down on Facebook and said, will you make these brownies for us? And she was like, no, like I don't do that anymore. <laughs> no. And I was like. I could like why not you know I can I have the recipe yeah she literally like it was like a secret she's had a cookbook but she had several recipes she kept out because they were like secret you know family recipes and so she trained me and taught me and I did all the baking to start with a goal that once it got big enough I would outsource you know a la Tim Ferriss um, style I would outsource all the shipping and the baking and anything you had to be here for and just run the you know the marketing and the business for my computer which is what I loved and so I got to that point and realized I, I just hated baking I haven't baked a single thing since and it wasn't like what I was passionate about but it got me you know out of Pepsi and trying something so from there I started an online course helping families with college admissions in the US and and I loved the online course model and I loved helping people, helping them figure out their lives. But I was like, okay, I, I don't I don't care about college admissions in the way that like I, I need to be to really be the face of this brand. And so from there, I started traveling with that business and I started doing a lot of career and just kind of like this emotional coaching because I found it was what people were asking me for help with, what I had been through. And I, I love it. I still do a lot of that to this day. And then I transitioned into Beach Commute, which I run today, which helps um, anyone who is aspiring to travel to learn how to get a remote job, uh, figure out which career is right for them, which is my specialty and how to negotiate and Basically, again, starting with end in mind, if you want to be a digital nomad, how do you make this your life through a career and how do you get that job? And that's where I am today. This is is the Radio Vagabond Vagabond Podcast. And I can take anything you can throw at me and nothing can get me down. Life is looking so bright, the sun is up again, I feel fly no clouds in my We need to 
dive a little bit more into Beach Commute. I, yeah. I love the name, by the way. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> you didn't start that uh, business alone. You have a, a co-founder. Yes. So two co-founders. Oh. One of them is the co-founder of Wi-Fi Tribe, um, which we can get into because that is uh, how I started my full-time, like really full-time nomading with the Wi-Fi Tribe community. And that's really a big part of my, I've been to over 70 countries and a lot of those have been with Wi-Fi Tribe um, and Wi-Fi Tribe friends. And then another one of our Wi-Fi Tribe friends, so Diego, who's the co-founder of Wi-Fi Tribe, he and I were in Bolivia on a chapter, a Wi-Fi Tribe chapter, that's where he's from, um, with our third friend, Jeff, and the three of us are just so passionate about helping people travel the world and become digital nomads and just we all love business and like just we're kind of best friends all together there and and so we run this business together and it's so fun to have partners after being such a solo you know preneur for so long and and people come to you and say i'm thinking of becoming a nomad or who are the typical people who come to you in uh, at, at beach commute so it's the people who really at the end of the day it's someone who like you and like me want to travel the world and they probably don't really care how if they could make you know a zillion dollars with the lottery that would be great but i always tell people you know you you run your own business i run my own business now but the the fastest quickest easiest and most reliable way to have an income while you are traveling the world is to work as an employee for an existing company. So the course that we do helps you figure out what company could you, should you work for? What would you love? What is that job role? How do you negotiate with that employer so that you can start traveling the world really as, as quickly as possible? And we talked a little bit about this in my interview on my podcast, but you're saying, you know, as a freelancer, as an entrepreneur, as a freelancer, you don't always, you know, it's such an influx of money. And in the beginning, you might have some and then you lose your clients and you're stuck across the world. Or as an entrepreneur, it can sometimes take two years to, to run a successful business if it if it ever is successful. So what we do is help people, again, as fast as possible, get a, re- a job that you can do remotely from anywhere in the world so that you can start traveling as quickly as possible. Mm-hmm. I have the feeling that COVID has and will have an impact on uh, companies' willingness to uh, let people work remotely. Uh, yeah. I heard that uh, Twitter said to their employees, if you if you want to come back to the office, you can do that. But if you want to uh, sit on a beach in Bali and do as long as you do your work. Yeah. And I think uh, it's become the new normal that it's okay not to be in, in the same office space. Yeah. And it's been interesting to watch. So for a while, obviously, during COVID, no one was in any offices and so long people were like, are we going to go back? Are we not? Are they going to make us? Now I've got a taste of freedom. Now they're making me go back. So it's been an interesting mix where, you know, I have a lot of friends still back in the States. None of my friends, you know, from home live a digital nomad life. And I would say like half of them have to go back into the office already already, or it's coming up soon. Or um, like you said, they have a choice of like, you can, if you want, but you don't have to. And then Even when they give people permission to say, all right, you don't have to come into our our office, there's so many companies who who don't really understand like the taxes and how it all works with health benefits and running their business with employees who are in Bali or Argentina or wherever you are in the world. So they're like, you can work from home, but it needs to be at your home address in the country, you know, where we are. And so a lot of what we do is help people to navigate that and be able to negotiate um, from an intelligent place to say, actually, this is the way it is. This is why it won't change anything for you. This is why, you know, how I'm going to be able to work with Wi-Fi and, you know, overcome all of those objections, basically. Mm -hmm. Are your clients mainly from the U.S.? Because uh, the rules for... Um, yeah, insurance and benefits are, are varies from country and tax uh, from country yeah. to country. It's it certainly does. And no, I would say about fifty percent of our clients are from the U.S., but there's people from France, from um, Germany, from Canada, from all over the world. So a lot of what we teach again is more of just saying, here's all the things that might come up. Sometimes you'll have to do research specifically for your own country, but generally. Uh, there's a lot of just trends and themes and ways to speak to it that is applicable no matter which country you're in. And sometimes that means when you're negotiating or getting a new job, asking to be a contractor instead of an employee or if you find a job in another country. So there's there's all different ways to work around that we teach. 
Is that a lawnmower in the background? Yes, it just started. It's like a leaf blower. <laughs> <laughs> it's like right below the window. We can't win. I wonder. Yep, there's two. While Marissa moves into a more quiet room, let me give you a podcast recommendation. It's called Amateur Traveler, and it's produced and hosted by my good friend Chris Christensen. He's an OJ of travel podcasting, and his podcast is, well, let's hear it from Chris. Whether you're traveling or dreaming about travel, Amateur Traveler has something for you. Amateur Traveler is a podcast that's been in continuous production for 16 years. We have episodes on every continent, every state, and almost every country. Each episode has pictures and links to help you with your trip planning. Whether you want to hear about your favorite destination that you've been to or discover new destinations and new adventures, if you want to go there, we probably have an episode. AmateurTraveler.com As Chris said, there are episodes from just about everywhere. So how I use it is to dive into the archives and then find an episode or episodes from the place I'm about to go to to make sure that I don't miss anything. There are so many nuggets in each episode, so go check it out. AmateurTraveler.com If travel is your passion and you want escapism while still upholding your work and family responsibilities, you can travel vicariously from the comfort of your own home. This is, this is the, Radio, the Vagabond. Radio Vagabond Podcast. Gotta keep moving. Are you in a closet now? <laughs> I'm in a different bedroom. <laughs> Just before we were interrupted, uh, we, we talked a little bit about uh, Wi-Fi Tribe. Uh, I've met people from Wi-Fi Tribe. Uh, one of my visits to Cape Town, I got to uh, spend a lot of time with the, a lot of the Wi-Fi Tribers and got to hang out with them. But I've never been a part of it. I've never been a part of uh, Wi-Fi Tribe. It's something that appeals to me. And then I, th- I think, mm, yeah, well, I can I can book my own place to stay i can find a place with wi-fi i don't need to pay extra for that but you you've done it and uh, tell me a little bit sell the wi-fi tribe idea to somebody like me yeah i will and i think you'd even though you don't work for them i know i don't (laughs) but i'm like the number one fan so let them know i sent you if you listen and end up applying but um, it's it's amazing so i totally understand where you're coming from you're like why would i you do end up paying you know, more for your, with Wi-Fi Tribe, I mean, back up, you're paying for your accommodations. You basically stay, it's anywhere from four to six weeks. Usually it's around four weeks is a chapter, what we call. And so at any given time, there might be a chapter, like one in Greece, one in Mexico, one in Kenya, and one in Chiang Mai in Thailand or something like that. So there's usually anywhere from three to five chapters at any given time. And it's just, it's not like a permanent location. It's just a month at a time. There's a calendar set up ahead of time. And so you know, you sign up for whatever country you want to go to, whatever city like they're in or town or wherever they are. And you basically commit and say, all right, I'm going to show up. I'll be there for those four weeks. And Wi-Fi Tribe finds accommodation. So it's anywhere from 10 to 20 digital nomads who are together. So they find accommodations for everyone and you live either whether it's an apartment or a house or a villa, you know, it just depends on where in the world you are. And the beautiful thing about it is that when you show up, you have an immediate community of 10 to 20 other people who have gotten there on the same day. So it's not like everyone, you know, I guess you do know some people when you've done it a while, but it's a new group altogether, but you immediately have all of these shared values, all of these share, um, you know, basically a bond right away. You're living with people, so you get to know them quickly. And it's the best for me because when you show up, suddenly you're like, all right, I have people to co-work with. And they're really brilliant, you know, people who are running all different businesses and working for different companies with different experiences. It's kind of like a mastermind. Suddenly you're like, oh, I didn't know I needed to learn that. And thank you for teaching me. And then you also have people, you know, to go to the gym with, to go on weekend trips with, to go out to meals with, or you can be by yourself. So it's not, it's not like it's set up where you're like, everyone has to do this, this day and this, this. You're just there for the month and it's up to you together to decide if you want to take weekend trips and where do you want to go or do you not? Or maybe some people will go and you just want to hang by yourself for the weekend. It's totally up to you. But when I first started nomading, I I would just kind of convince like my college friends or my friends from home or people to kind of meet me here and there when I got started. But really when I went full-time nomad, I started in Bali 
on a Wi-Fi tribe chapter, and then I did another one in Chiang Mai and Thailand back to back. No, the two big ho nomad hotspots. I know, but I didn't know. I was such an amateur. I was like, I'm going to get there and not know anyone. So, you know, I arrived at 2.30 in the morning in Bali, and I was greeted by, you know, another triber who let me into the house. And the next morning, like that morning, I remember going to breakfast with these two people. My friend took me to the gym, and then I was just working. And it's like immediate friends and immediate comfort so you are paying like if I had gone to Bali alone and I've been nomading for many years now so I'd probably go to Bali you know with other friends how I, who I now know but when I first got started it was such an amazing way to tap into a community right away so when you say of course you can book your own accommodations and things for cheaper but what you're really paying a slight premium for is that community and those friendships so in all my years of nomading, which uh, on and off, you know, I've been nomading for like six years. Uh, I've done seven chapters with Wi-Fi Tribe, so seven months of many years. But I would say almost probably 95% of the time I'm traveling, I'm with Wi-Fi Tribe friends who I've met. So the same way we have, you know, Nomad Cruise community, I'll go on a chapter and then I meet people and then we'll hop to some of their countries together by ourselves unofficially. Or now... Um, you know, I will meet up with like six of my friends who are like my best wife, I tribe friends. And we'll just say like, let's go to, to Mexico for a month. Let's go to Guatemala for a month. Let's go to Bulgaria for the month. And so it's, and, and like Nomad Cruise, there's such a, you know, we have a whole Slack channel. And so anywhere I go, if I don't know a triber, it's like you get there. And if someone, someone, you know, knows them and it's like an immediate friend. So it feels, it's been really an important part of my travel experience. Yeah, you 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 had me sold. I, <laughs> I I I haven't thought about it in the last couple of years, but now I'm gonna go back and look at it. And uh, there's also uh, something similar called Remote Year yeah. uh, that does some of the same stuff. And I have friends who's been on both the Wi-Fi Tribe and uh, Remote Year, and I'm sure there are others. Yeah. Um, and I've I've had kind of the same experience when I've done uh, Nomad Cruises that I really become so close with these people. I yeah. see my Nomad Cruise community as my second family. Yeah. And whenever I go, I've, I've done three so far, and uh, hopefully they will get it going again soon. And um, and I'll be the first to sign up because Aww. I mostly because I I I, I want to I want to see my friends and I want to see my family and I could easily see that with the wi-fi tribe or yeah. remote year or something similar and and doing that so i'm gonna after we've done talking i'm gonna Yay. go back online and look at that tell them i <laughs> sent you <laughs> i love it but you don't have to sign up for a year uh you, no, you can take yeah. chapters as you as yeah. they call it and it was something when you mentioned remote year so when I first got started or was looking for some, basically remote year was one of the first things I had heard of. But at the time it used to be, you had to do it for 12 months, like a full year. And you would go 12 different countries one month at a time. And so when I was looking at that, I was like, it seems amazing, but there's countries I've already been to or don't necessarily want to go to first. And I don't even know if I want to be a nomad for 12 months. So I found Wi-Fi tribe was really amazing for me because you sign up and you can do one chapter a year, or you can do no one. I don't think just 12 chapters, but you could do, you know, three, four or five, you can do as many or as few as you want. And it's just a great way for me now, especially, um, like you said, I don't need to do them in Bali and Thailand. It was really important for me when I first started, but now I'm eyeing ones in like Mauritius and Namibia and, um, kind of those locations where it's harder to, to have a nomad community right when you land somewhere, and maybe some, like I did one in Oman and it was really amazing to have, I think there was 11 of us there. And so like I had people for the weekend trips and it's just really nice to me now, especially in some of those more um, kind of harder to nomad places. Yeah. That is on my 2022 Yay! list. Maybe I'll see you on a chapter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We, we need to, we need to talk about where to go. Yeah. Well, Wi-Fi tribe was on my list. And then I had to take it off again because apparently, wait for it, I am too old. Wi-Fi tribe don't accept people my age. When I tried to apply, I got this message. Our current experiences are designed for people between 21 and 45. 
This helps us keep lifestyle expectations aligned. But we've also got something in the pipeline for all ages too. If you're above 45, you can join the mailing list to be the first to hear about our mixed ages experiences when we launch them. That's what they say. They also say that they're putting a lot of thought and care into designing travel experiences that cater for all ages. And that if they do end up launching a tribe for 45 plus people, they will, quote, focus a little more on cultural immersion, culinary adventures, exploring exciting cities and spending time together in nature. I must say that I'm disappointed to read this. I've been on Nomad Cruise and I'm part of that community and I honestly don't see an issue with me being slightly older. And I'm pretty sure that if you ask some of my friends from that group of people, they also don't see a problem. Being in my mid-50s doesn't mean that I'm only into visiting churches and bird watching and not going to concerts and bungee jumping. So come on, Wi-Fi tribe. Not cool. Travel is possible at any age. Just not with Wi-Fi Tribe. Your sense of adventure is just over the horizon. So, reach out and grab it. This is the Radio Vagabond. Gotta keep moving. Uh, so you say you've been a nomad for uh, um, on and off for six years. Yeah. So a little bit more than me. I'm gonna get you. Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, for people who's not been uh, nomading what is what will you say is the the best part about being a nomad oh that is a loaded question and we'll get to the worst part after that (laughs) both are equally i love to talk about both because it's so important but the best parts it's funny um one, I would just say the freedom to start like as as a cloak to all of it the freedom to be in a foreign country to be back in your hometown, to be, you know, visit a friend who's having a baby. Like you could be, whether you're really traveling or not, it's just so freeing to know that you can be anywhere you want. But within that, uh, I know when I first, as I mentioned, like when I was planning with my ex to go travel the world, I really thought it was about seeing bucket list locations. I thought it was to say, I want to go to this beach here and this city here and see this thing here and like check, check, check all the top 10 things you're you know supposed to do here and so on. And as I've been nomading for so many years now, I would say the most amazing part to me is really the people that I've met along the way mm. and the community that I built. So the same as like values of nomad cruisers as Wi-Fi tribe is really anybody who is seeking out this digital nomad life is just a different kind of person and it doesn't make anyone better or worse, but it's my kind of people who are open-minded and it's just so fun to be able to learn from people from all over the world who come from different backgrounds, different countries, different socioeconomic um, backgrounds, and just to have these amazing, amazing, amazing friendships and to experience the epicness of travel in the world with those people. So I would say that to me has been the benefit I didn't know I would love so much, but has been the most important. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, you get to know the community that you're traveling with uh, if, if you're in, in, in Wi-Fi tribe or something else. Um, but uh, do you also uh, get close with the locals? It's a really awesome question. I love this conversation uh, because everybody who I travel with is a little bit different. I have some Wi-Fi tribe friends who kind of say, all right, it's nice to have you guys, but like, I'm going to spend the weekend really just in the culture here, getting to know locals. Like, That's really important to them. And not to say it's not important to me. I always find that like going to local gyms and exercise classes, that's my way that I've really kind of get to know the local cultures wherever I go. But I honestly really invest my time more in uh, getting to know other digital nomads. And that's judged sometimes, I think, by other people to say like, you know, you're not getting to know all the local people here. But it's also my life and when I invest you know, my time and experiences and wherever I am with other nomads, I'm likely to see them whether I'm in Bali or Mexico or Oman or Bulgaria or Argentina. You know, it's like they follow me wherever I go. And so it's it's my family, it's my friendships. And, and so what's neat to me is that while I'm not always getting to know a local 
in the country I'm in, I'm learning so much about other countries from, you know, my friends aren't all American. They're from all over the world. And so when I just did this last Eastern European trip, I mentioned, um, like when my, I had a, a Wi-Fi tribe friend in Mexico who was from Romania and I got to be in Romania with him when I was there. And I met up with a friend in Lithuania who I'd met in, where did we meet in Mexico as well, um, when I was there. And so I feel like I get to know about so many local cultures in different countries and then I get to meet them in their places, but I'm definitely not always investing my time in, um, locals in that place. And sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't, but it's a little bit different than a lot of people do. Mm. I do know that you, you went to a, a wedding. Was that in Egypt or Jordan? Or <laughs> in Egypt. Yeah. Is that a, a Wi-Fi triber or one of the locals? That was locals. And that was a fun one. So this is the beauty of why it's good to solo travel and kind of get out of your comfortable Wi-Fi tribe people. So I was actually, I was in a Wi-Fi tribe chapter in Argentina, and then I had like a week and a half in between and was going to a chapter in Oman because it was just a location I really wanted to go to. Oh, yeah. And I decided I was going to meet um, my co-founder, Jeff, actually, when Beach Community co-founder, was going to come to Egypt with me and then didn't end up coming. So I did a solo travel trip through Egypt and Jordan um, by myself. And when I got there, I had a taxi driver who was just like driving me to the pyramids one day. And he's, <laughs> we, I, I'm like you, I'm like very outgoing. We're just chatting and talking. And he kind of took me every, he was like, do you want to, can I take you to dinner? Like, I'll take you to my favorite restaurant. And I was like, all right. Like, I really got to see the local Cairo. And he was like, my, my cousin's getting married tonight. Like, do you want to come to the wedding? And it wasn't, um, oh my God. And, for me, like, you really have to sit and check. You know, I was, uh, how old was I? Probably 31 or 32. I guess probably 30, 31 at the time as a, a fe you know, a solo female traveler. And it's really important. Like, I have to check in with my gut of, like, is this a good idea? <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had spent all day with this guy, so I really trusted him. But, like, I was going, it was probably, like, a 30-minute drive outside of the heart of Cairo into, like, a neighborhood that was like in the middle of nowhere, we're driving through camels and horses and, and all of that. And, um, but I'm, I'm a yes person. And so as long as it feels right in my gut, I'm, you know, at first I was like, I don't have anything to wear. Like, I don't know if I should be going, but I was like, I can't not go to this wedding in, in Cairo with this taxi driver. So, um, I went and it was like in between these two apartment buildings and it was like this huge, like a stage and loud DJ. And there was a horse that was like, riding through the middle and all the men and women were separated. So the women were like behind a wall that was like a smaller area. And then it's all the men. Um, again, this is just like their, their cultural practices yeah. were all in one place. And so when I got there, I was like, uh, we picked up two of his other family members who were all men as well. And they were like, come sit with us. And so I'm the only female of all men. And there's like females behind a wall. And I, I remember asking like, shouldn't I go sit over there? Like this doesn't feel right. And they were like, they don't speak English. Come sit with us. We'll take care of you. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm probably offending everybody here. I don't have anything to wear. Like this is bad. Um, but they ended up like sending me on the horse through the middle of the dance floor. And like, I got to, <laughs> it was amazing. Like I talked to the men all night about like their wives and their divorces and like what the culture was like. And it's one of those moments where like I got in somehow into this magical moment of, um, I think weddings are especially really cool if you can ever go in other countries. But, um, oh, yeah. so there are definitely times when I, I try to get into the local culture, but being alone definitely helps to do that. Yeah. I was, um, I remember I was invited to a wedding, but it was a long time after I left. I, I became friends with the very young, uh, hotel manager in, uh, Siem Reap, mm -hmm. uh, well, in, uh, in Cambodia. Yeah. And, uh, and he invited me later to his uh, sister's wedding, but I, I just wasn't able Aww. to, to go at that time. I was in a completely different place. Yeah. Uh, when I was, when I was in Bali, I also made friends with the, uh, the, the, the driver I had there and, uh, he invited me as the only uh, tourist yeah, uh, to at attend a very, very special uh, religious festivity where they were uh, sitting on the on, on, 
on the street eating and then all the leftovers and the the plates that were made out of grass and stuff like right. that they put that in a big box and then carried that into the ocean and as a as an offering wow. to the ocean because a lot of them were fishers so that was a unique experience uh, and i also had one uh, in uh, in in tishnit in in morocco in a very small uh, city in in morocco where i became good friends with the local butcher <laughs> uh, it Amazing. was uh, it was the kind of butcher shop that was out to the street, and uh, you were standing on the sidewalk buying the meat, and then taking it next door to a different place right. that had a grill, and they would um, um, make a barbecue out of the meat Amazing. and sell you some salad. Yeah, and then he was just closing up, and came down and sat with me, and and that's where it comes in as a good thing for me to do the podcast because obviously I started recording a chat with him and right. um, it gives me an excuse to speak to people yeah and we be just became so good friends and he invited me for lunch at his house and uh, when a month a few weeks later I was in another place and I got sick with pneumonia and I had to go to the hospital in uh, go back to Tishnit he came there and helped Aww. me and um, and and uh, helped me translate and uh, and he even insisted on paying for the uh, the hospital bill even though i said no no i got oh insurance but it was no no that's the way we do it Aww. here and uh, we, we we help our they friends so, so and a lot of these people i still communicate with yeah. we're still uh, texting now and then and maybe sometimes calling each other but yeah. I, for me that's the oh my god that's the most important thing it's the best i had a similar what, or it was supposed to be a wedding experience during COVID, but when I was in Thailand, it was also a week, I was like between chapters by myself and I went to get like a foot massage, just, you know, as you do in Thailand. And I was sitting <laughs> next to these two Indian boys who are, you know, from Calcutta in, in India. And then we ended up, we were like hanging out that night and we, we happened to be in the next location together for a couple of days. And I still keep up with them today, but both of them had gotten engaged soon after and invited me to their wedding in India. And I was like, this is the best. Like, I can't wait to go to this Indian wedding. I, I really was going to go. And then it was April during COVID and didn't get to, but I still keep in touch with mm. all of these people as well. So it's, uh, it's so fun to be able to have, you know, just ways to communicate even after you're gone. Yeah. But what is it if it like um, for you as as you know that you're leaving soon um, in order to get those connections and uh, oh that's a nice person but maybe I'll never see them again. Yeah. Is that something that's putting you down or just uh, something you've gotten used to? Yeah, that's why as I mentioned before my I guess strategy if you want to go, I don't ever think about it that but the way that I travel I always feel like it's never a goodbye it's a see you later it sounds like so corny and cliche but really I, I do invest my time for the most part um, not necessarily in someone local who will only be in that country unless I go back but all the nomads that I meet and I'm sure you know this to be true it's like you never know who you'll you know I was just in uh, Prague and had a friend who happened to like repost something on Instagram Instagram that he was there too and I was like amazing like I hadn't seen him since before COVID and was such like one of my favorite people so um I I always feel like I will see nomads again and it's hard like I have um you know I was just on through WhatsApp I have a one of my dearest friends who I've um traveled with a bunch who I met actually not even on a chapter but through friends of friends at Wi-Fi tribe who were like you two need to know each other she came met me in Costa Rica we had never met we traveled a ton together and we still voice note every single day, like multiple times about our life. And, you know, we're just trying to figure out where to meet back up. So logistically, it's harder because, you know, when you're just at your home and I say, quote, normal life, you know, it's the same people. They're always there. And here you definitely have to be more intentional about like, I want to see you again. Like, where are you going? Here's where I am. How can we meet? But I keep in touch and I really do feel like I see the people who I meant to see again and again. Yeah. Absolutely. What about romantic relationships? Is that anything you have any thoughts about? Because that's difficult as well. Yeah. So I've I always find people who are nomads. I guess that's like I said how how I surround myself and how I meet my time. But um, yeah, I've been with um, someone who is from Israel. He and I were just through Europe together. All of those months. Now we met in Mexico last year. We're in. Um, Costa Rica and Guatemala and just went to like 10 other countries and we live the same life, right? We met through friends of friends. And, um, I think it's so easy to, for, for me, if I'm like back in Atlanta or, um, in a place like 
I, I feel like I am a traveler. And when I'm, when I'm trying to, you know, date at home on the typical dating apps or whatever, I'm like, these, these aren't my people. I don't feel as excited not to say it's not possible, but I find that traveling, it's so much easier to meet, um, romantic partners who share those travel values. If that's something, you know, that you value. So I've had several, you know, long-term relationships with traveling people. And it's interesting because, um, I feel like, in the typical way you date, you know, if I'm back in Atlanta or home, it's like you might see someone once for, you know, an hour or two and then a week later and then five days later for just, you know, here and there. And as a nomad, you're like, okay, we live together now. <laughs> like there's, there's no separation. And if you want to stay with me, we're flying to this country tomorrow and like, come, come live with me there. <laughs> Why not? So yeah, that's, that's where you say you really put you, the relationship on a test is when you're traveling together. For and, sure. Uh, and, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, you get to know everything way quicker. So for me, like four months of you know nomad dating is like three years of of a normal relationship. So I have found amazing people, and you just you know it does take take some intention to either say, all right, I'm going here, you're going there, because we had that plan. So we'll meet back up here, or let's change plans and travel together, or you know X Y Z. So it, it it takes intention, but if you're meeting someone else who has that freedom you also have the freedom to be anywhere you want. So there's a lot of things that are easier about nomad dating. And then there's a lot of things that, you know, when you're living with someone or in a foreign country, how do you split up and what happens and you don't have your base? It's, it's hard in a lot of ways, but um, it's definitely possible. And I have tons of friends who have met, you know, spouse, spouses now and have all of that. So it's, it's an interesting world. It's different, but I think it's so fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's circle back. I, I promised you that there would be a, what's the worst part about being a nomad. Yes. Uh, what, are, what are some of the downsides? Yeah, I think there's times where you just kind of, after so much movement, sometimes you just crave like home um, or just that base or your family. Like when things, I always tell people the highs, like the, the joys and the highlights of traveling are higher than anything I ever experienced and, you know, a non-nomad life, but the lows are lower. So there's times where maybe I, I know I was in, um, after like six months of back to back traveling, I was in Guatemala with like 30 amazing friends having like the best time ever. And then six of us got, it wasn't food poisoning, but it was like this three day stomach virus where I just remember I was like up at three in the morning, like couldn't keep anything in my body, felt like I was going to die. I mean, it wasn't, but you know, in those moments. And I just remember being like, I want to be home. Like, I'm so tired. <laughs> like, Where's what, my mom? Yeah, I'm like, I'm so old to be thinking this, but like, I just want someone, like, I'm tired. <laughs> so there's moments like, <laughs> you know, there are moments like that or when you split up from a relationship and you're kind of like, oh my gosh, my people aren't here. I don't have a home. I have no, like nothing underneath my feet, my life. It's like, the perfect best thing. And then suddenly there's nothing. And, um, I think those moments are really hard or just when you get really exhausted or you're moving from place to place, or you get somewhere where it's like you sign an apartment lease for a month in Airbnb and you're like, I don't really like this. And now I'm stuck here and where are all my friends, <laughs> right? Like, so or again, I'm, I'm in the wrong neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. So again, it, it's just, there's so many unknowns of it, but for the, I would say 95% of the time I'm like, how did I get so lucky that I made this my life? Like, I can't believe I'm here. I can't believe this is so amazing. But there are those times where you get in those low places where it's like, holy fuck, this is hard. I don't know where I am. I don't know what I'm going to do next. Who am I meeting? Where am I going? I don't know what country I'm sleeping in tonight. Like, you know, I had, I've had those moments too. And so the high highs come with the low lows. And so I would say that's the hardest part mm -hmm. where sometimes you're like, I just want to go home and just like turn off for a little bit. Yeah. And you don't always have that yeah. ability. Is it hard being a, a solo female traveler? Um, as to me, I'm an, I'm a dude. So yeah. I, I, I guess I have a few advantages. Uh, is, is it hard? Uh, and especially in some countries to be a solo female traveler? Yeah, definitely. Um, like through the Middle East, it's a lot harder. And just in general, I would say it's the same, even just living in whatever town you're from, there's things that women just have to think about that males don't. So even as I was just traveling and told you with um, my partner through Europe, we, I forget where we even landed. Maybe it was in Lithuania, Poland. I, have, I can't remember what countries we were in, but <laughs> we got somewhere and I think we landed at like, you know, or got off the bus. It was like one or two in the morning 
and wherever we were, it just didn't feel, you know, super safe. And I felt safe because I was with this male. But I remember telling him, like, if if I was traveling alone, I wouldn't have been able to take this bus time. I would have waited another day, gone in the morning, made sure I got here during the day and not, like, arrived in the middle of the night to a random bus stop in the middle of this country trying to find my Airbnb. So there's – where he was like, I've never thought about this. Like, I would, I would take this if I was alone. And I was like, yeah, that's the joys of being a male. But – there's times when it's advantageous to be a female too. I remember I was crossing the border from Oman to, um, we're going to Dubai to the UAE and sent like, we didn't have the right car. Uh, it was a rental car and we didn't have the right papers and they wouldn't let us in. And my friends and I just like sweet talked. Somehow we ended up in the country without a stamp and like came back in and had to sweet talk people to let us back in Oman. And our male, we had, it was, it was one female friend and one male. And he was like, I'm just going to sit in the back and not say anything. We're like, we got this, you know? <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I'm like, I will take full advantage of being a female when I can, because there's so many hardships. So I would say when I first got started, like, um, you know, I've, I've eased into it. I've been traveling for so many years now that, I feel, you know, I, I never would have started solo traveling through the Middle East, but I built my way up there. And so mm-hmm. I would say to anyone listening, it's just, there's definitely things you have to think of that men don't, but, um, yeah, once you, you know, you just learn to trust your intuition and, and get smart. And when I get to a place, you know, I'll ask an Uber driver or a taxi driver or someone at the airport or a friend who's been there to say, you know, is it okay to walk alone at night or is it not? Like, do I need to cover my shoulders and my knees in this location or do I not? Like what's what should I be doing or not doing and really listen to those recommendations. Yeah. And, and, yeah, and obviously use your common sense and don't walk down a dark alley and that yeah. goes for all of us uh, in the middle of the night and, 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 and stuff like that. And uh, I have experienced places where I wouldn't think about, sh- Oh, I shouldn't be walking right. down this neighborhood. Uh, for me, it would be, hmm, I, I don't see that. But then the locals say, Oh, you should definitely not go out right. here. Really? Yeah. Really? I, I normally say that I carry two weapons and one is my common sense uh, and, and the other is my smile. And you Aww. can get a long way with a smile. Totally so that's agree. one of the reasons that I I cannot wait for us not to be necessary, mandatory to wear a mask. So I'm Aww. able to <laughs> get a connection with the I smile again. You. Because um, I, I definitely, I was just on a plane back from I don't know, Madrid to Atlanta and I had a stewardess. You know, we had all our masks on and she gave me, uh, this, I think it was just like a bottle of water. It was a long flight and she was like, I can see you smiling like through your mask. I can tell by your eyes. And she was like, this is so nice. Like it really does go a long way. And I'm like you where whether you speak the language or not, like a smile goes a long way. Your intuition goes a long way. And it really is just about trusting yourself. But I think, you know, as I'm back in the States, um, even though like, you know, I'm at my parents' house and, and whether it's a nice neighborhood, like I don't feel comfortable walking alone here at night because there's like nobody around at night. So it really just depends on, you know, where you are and getting, yeah, just getting a feel for that and and using common sense, like you said, to say like, should I be doing this? Should I not? And I've been really, really lucky, knock on wood, using my intuition where I've never really had anything. Yeah. I've never had anything either, uh, never anything bad happen. And uh, that's also one of the things that uh, people who may be not traveling as much, they are thinking, oh, it's a, such a dangerous place out there. But it's really not. And 99% of all the people on the planet, they they want to do good. They want to yeah, be friendly sure. people. And uh, uh, obviously, in poor countries, it's uh, it can be a little bit different and uh, still yeah. use your common sense. But remember that it doesn't necessarily have to be such a dangerous place out there. Yeah, it's not. And like, you, yeah, I remember I lived in Nigeria for a month and uh, I was the um, a boyfriend at the time there too. But like, I couldn't really go anywhere without him, which was really frustrating. Um, so yeah, there's times where you just have to kind of figure it out of, of what you yeah, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. How can you make the most of it? But also you learn to say, you know, like when I'm in a cab, I, um, I think I was in uh, Czech Republic just recently. And we were, I was with my boyfriend at the time, but we were in a cab at like uh, two in the morning and the guy was like, oh, where are you, you know, are you from? Are you just visiting? And I was like, uh, no, I'm visiting family here. We're going back to their place. You know, we weren't. So I don't like to lie, but sometimes like it's important to say, you know, I, I said, I was like, I'm from Israel. That's where he's from. You know, people judge Americans and, uh, you know, you have money or you're an easier target. So you just kind of have to be wise about what, what you say, what you tell people and how to navigate that. Mm. 
we're almost at the end of this episode. I have a few more thoughts from Marissa. But before that, let me remind you that this episode is supported in part by Hotels25.com, the website that helps you find the best deals on hotel rooms, guest houses and hostels all around the world in one simple search. Hotels25.com As we heard, Marissa, you've been traveling full-time for six years. Do you know how many countries you've been to? I think I have a little app that keeps track. I think I'm at 72. Okay. Uh, so a lot. You've uh, got me beat. <laughs> yeah, 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 I got a little bit more, but uh, uh, I come from Europe, so I did a lot of uh, countries before uh, I, I even started. But uh, how long time are you going to keep doing it? Yeah, people always ask. They're like, you know, this is nice, but you know, you're. Gonna, I'm I'm 33 now. They're like, you're going to have to settle down and have kids, and then you can't travel and da da da. And I always like to say, as I mentioned, the the freedom before. I think the beauty of this lifestyle and the way I've set up, you know, my career and my life is that um, I don't know, and that's okay. Like as of now, I can't see ever stopping. I would love to have. Um, you know, maybe more of a home base that I could say, like not rent out all the time and just say, okay, I'm here for two months and I'm going to leave for four months. I'm going to come back for a month and I'm going to leave for two or five months or whatever and kind of pop back and forth. But, um, you know, I, I do want to have kids one day and I I feel like I've, I've met tons of people who do travel in different ways with kids, whether that's exactly. a couple months or full time. And um, I think it's such an amazing way to educate children and live so oh yeah yeah i would say i don't have an answer i i think i will keep doing this but i always give myself permission and freedom to say if it feels you know if i get tired at any point and i crave to stop i will and if i want to keep going i will and uh let like not set any rules for myself your podcast uh, that you run with uh, two friends, uh, you you share a lot. Sometimes it's just you talking about uh, nomading stuff and yep. uh, sharing tips and tricks. Uh, it's called Digital Nomad Experts. Uh, yes. What can you say about the podcast? Yeah, check it out. If you're somebody who maybe isn't yet traveling or isn't fully in the digital nomad life and would like to be, it shares a lot of our insights from, you know, 10 plus years combined of things or, you know, whether it's safety, how to make friends, how to get a job, how to, you know, set up the right electronics when you're trying to work remotely. And then we interview wonderful people like you. So we'll launch these uh, around the same time. We just, before this, recorded an episode interviewing you. So we interview tons of awesome nomads because to me what I want anyone listening to say is like this life is possible for you as well right and to hear other people's stories to hear our stories I think is so important because you and I are not different than anyone else right we're not special because we travel we just decided that it was a way we wanted to live so if that is appealing to you definitely check it out yeah definitely check it out the podcast is called Digital Nomad Experts, and Marissa's company, where they help aspiring nomads, is called Beach Commute. Go to beachcommute.com and learn more. And if you'd like to hear the interview with me on Digital Nomad Experts, I've also put a link to that in the notes section for this episode. My name is Palapo, and I gotta keep moving. See ya! Produced by RadioGuru.co.uk